Good evening and uh, welcome and thank you for joining Sustainable Princeton's Great Ideas event. Tonight's program is Going Beyond Climate Action and Local Environmental Health. My name is Jenny Ludmer, and I'm the Community Outreach Manager for Sustainable Princeton. If we could go to the next slide, Christine. Before we get started, we'd like to take a moment and thank our generous sponsor, NRG Energy Inc., whose support allows us to bring you these events. We also wish to thank our longtime partner, the Princeton Public Library, we hope it's not too long before we can return to having these events live and in person at the library when it's safe to do so. Next slide. This evening's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website within a few days. You can click on the events tab, look for the great ideas, ideas series and find this recording as well as all of our previous Great Ideas recordings from, excuse me, from the past year or two. Next slide. At any time during this webinar, we invite you to click on the Q&A button at the, on your toolbar to enter your questions. We will do our best to get them answered during the Q&A session at the end of the program. Next slide. Okay, for those of you who have attended our recent events, this may look familiar. Princeton's Climate Action Plan has 85 different actions. They are um, sorted into five different focus areas, but each of these actions have co-benefits, and there are five different co-benefits. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So what are these co-benefits? The first is that it promotes equity. Uh, next one. Another is that it fosters economic sustainability. It improves local environmental quality. Next one. It enhances public safety and health. And another co-benefit is that it builds resilience. And you can go to the next slide. So over the past year, we have had three other going beyond uh, webinars, the goal of which was to dive into each of these co-benefits. Uh, tonight, we are gonna be focusing on the co-benefit of improving local environmental quality. Next slide. So, like I said, tonight is a deep dive into the co-benefit of local environmental quality. This co-benefit is to improve our local air and water quality, reduce pollution, and preserve habitat diversity and ecosystems. So, as an example, let's consider one action of the natural resources sector of the Climate Action Plan. That action is to appoint an open space manager to oversee municipally managed land and ensure it's managed in a manner that protects and enhances natural resources. So we are thrilled to learn that the municipality is acting on this step by interviewing candidates for an open space manager. Um, so we're, we're delighted they're taking that step and we look forward to this um, new person joining the municipality. And next slide. Uh, I think you skipped one, Christine. Uh, Christine, could you please go back? I'm going to be intro. Oh, sorry. No, you're wrong. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me start by saying that we have um, three delightful speakers this evening. Um, they're each focusing on a different sector of the local environmental quality. So one is the co-benefit of uh, water. We have Dan Van Abs with us. We also have Sharon Davis discussing um, the co-benefit of air. And we have Trish Shanley with us talking about um, the co-benefit of um, land. Um, and so we're delighted to have Jay Watson as our um, moderator this evening. 
And if you could just give me a second, I am pulling up his bio. <clears throat> and I apologize for the delay. Okay, Jay is the Senior Director for Statewide Land Protection and Community Relations for the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. He has been working to protect New Jersey's landscape and environment for nearly 40 years. Uh, prior to joining the nonprofit land conservancy sector, Jay spent nearly 30 years in various roles of the New Jersey Envi Department of Environmental Protection. He began his career as a project manager for the Green Acres program and worked his <clears throat> way up to become the program administrator. He has a very long list of other accomplishments, including um, the fact that he uh, worked with the Parks and Forestry, Historic Preservation, Fish and Wildlife, Green Acres Program, Shore Protection, Dam Safety, and others. He was the Deputy Commissioner of New Jersey DEP, um, which he retired from in 2010. Uh, so we're delighted to have Jay, who's got a tremendous amount of um, qualifications and backgrounds with us um, tonight to introduce the other panelists and um, act as our moderator. So thank you so much for joining us, Jay. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I just want to share a couple of slides. So thanks again to the organizers for uh, allowing me to briefly share some of the work um, that New Jersey Conservation Foundation is doing across New Jersey's very diverse landscape. Uh, I know I'm only the moderator, so I'm gonna limit my presentation uh, to just a few slide decks um, in preparation to get to the meat of this program this evening, which is the fabulous uh, presenters that we have going forward. So I just wanted to share a little bit about the work New Jersey Conservation Foundation is doing across the landscape. I assume everybody can see the uh, my slide deck. So New Jersey Conservation Foundation has been working in across New Jersey for uh, over 60 years, uh, since 1961. And we've been a part of preserving over 125,000 acres across the state. Uh, some of it for open space or conservation lands, recreation conservation lands, but we've also been uh, very successful in preserving a lot of uh, agricultural lands in the state to keep the garden in the garden state. Um, we are stewards of those lands. A lot of the lands that we preserve, um, we take very seriously uh, the management responsibility uh, to make sure that we're taking care of all those lands um, for all of the virtues and reasons that we decided to protect them for in the first place. So we take that very seriously. And then finally, we do a lot of advocacy across New Jersey. And, um, you know, we're always uh, making sure that people are doing the right thing from a policy perspective. And we've been very active for many years to make sure that we keep the pressure on uh, the decision makers across the state. So our current strategic plan um, directs us to really start focusing more on prioritizing lands in the landscape. Excuse me, somebody's coming in, my dog's going crazy, of course, just in time for my presentation, uh, as directing us to uh, focus on those lands that help um, us uh, mitigate climate uh, change um, implications. Um, we are have been long uh, preserving lands uh, for recreation conservation, but now we're directed to very specifically prioritize those lands that uh, provide resiliency throughout the state um, by providing uh, lands for species movement uh, and marsh migration, and also to try to identify those lands that are doing the best jobs at sequestering carbon uh, in the state. So as you can see on my slide here, we have um, uh, just uh, the New Jersey Conservation Blueprint map up. And I'm hoping that if you all get a chance, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted. My dog, of course, is going crazy right at the time of my uh, segment but uh, he'll calm down. Um, but this is uh, just one of the, the landing page of the New Jersey Conservation Blueprint. And I hope that everyone takes the opportunity to uh, take a look at this uh, website. Uh, it's uh, njmap2, the number two.com. And it is a fabulous resource for anybody who is interested in New Jersey's landscape, what's going on, what's available and what we can do. It um, is just a remarkable tool. I, I refer to it as GIS for dummies. I use it every single day and it's just been remarkable. But what I'm pointing to here is the, uh, the Sourlands area where New Jersey Conservation Foundation is doing an incredible amount of work in the Sourlands. And as you can see, the darker color on this climate resiliency map 
uh, shows that the Sourlands are very important, very critical for our, our climate resiliency efforts. Um, so we just recently in the last year uh, preserved uh, over 400 additional acres in the Sourlands and we're now managing a 1200 acre preserve uh, that's just incredible. And we're looking forward to opening, opening it to the general public very soon. But we're really um, trying to make sure that we are managing that property, that preserve uh, for all of the reasons that we, that we you know, sought it in the first place for climate reasons, but also because you know, the Sourlands are uh, probably one of the most important landscapes for neotropical migrating songbirds in the entire Eastern seaboard. So we're very proud of our work there. So we're managing the forest, of course, and we're promoting proforestation in that area, but we're also working with the farmers in that region so that they are uh, moving their agricultural practices to more sustainable practices in permaculture. So there's a lot to, uh, to talk about going forward in the Sourlands and hopefully you'll keep an eye on the work that we do there. So the data is always improving. Um, there's a lot of good data on resiliency in the New Jersey Conservation Blueprint, but uh, we're hopeful that the data is improved uh, throughout the nation on helping us identify those lands that are best for climate se uh, for uh, carbon sequestration. So that's that's to come, and I'm sure that we're always adding to that that uh, database. Um, New Jersey Conservation Foundation has also jumped into the space in urban agriculture. Urban agriculture is taking off across New Jersey. Uh, providing uh, places to grow nutritious food in communities, in neighborhoods, provides access to people in these neighborhoods and communities to fresh grown, pro locally grown products, but also provides people with green spaces where they can go and, and assemble and kind of reconnect with the land, if you will. So we're working very closely with the Garden State Agrihood Project and others uh, in the Mercer County Park Commission um, in, in Trenton and the two acre project known as Capital City Farm right next to the Trenton area soup kitchen, which is right here on the map. So this is a two acre was an old rail siding and it was a mess at one point. And we reclaimed that property and have turned it into this remarkable community asset now. Um, the site now has everything you need. We bought a barn. This is our barn and we filled it up with uh, everything you need to, to operate a farm. Uh, so our concept is, is just only thing you have to do now is bring the community in and people who have agricultural production knowledge and this thing can be successful and an amazing asset to a neighborhood that really could use a lot of benefit. So this year will be the fifth year of production. Keep an eye out for some announcements that will happen pretty soon. Um, we're hoping that Mercer County Park Commission as part of the How Production, uh, How Farms, uh, production is going to assist in this project where they'll be teaching the history of agriculture at Howell Farm and the future of agriculture in the capital city of Trenton. So keep your eye out for that. We're hoping to have some announcements pretty soon. I also mentioned the Garden State Agrihood Project, which is a new nonprofit that was formed that looks at the capital city farm as a, 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 a cornerstone asset to begin conversations in the community about all of the good that this farm can provide to the community to engage them around everything we do there and to serve as a community land trust to start purchasing properties and providing other housing opportunities and other commerce opportunities so that when investment starts coming into that neighborhood that north trenton community that the people that live there now will continue to be able to afford to live there in the future so the garden state agrihood project are an upstart nonprofit, and um, keep an eye out for them as well we're also taking this urban agriculture work to uh, other cities like Camden City. Uh, this is the La Esperanza uh, Community Garden in North Camden. And we're working there with the local community. Uh, so many of these sites, I mean, you've heard these horror stories of people being invested in these spaces, these community gardens and grow spaces uh, for many years, investing time, investing their social capital. And then uh, the first developer that comes along, uh, the property sold out from under them and they've kind of lost connection with the land and, and the project. Uh, so New Jersey Conservation Foundation is, is working very hard to work with these local communities to see if we can make these, these spaces permanent through the acquisition processes. And finally, for me, um, we're very engaged. I'm very proud of the work that the Outdoor Equity Alliance is doing. We formed uh, in, in Mercer County, it's called Nature for All, basically. We're trying to make sure that we're taking work to the people, to the communities that need our work, 
not only making sure that uh, people in every segment of Mercer County has access to the wonderful open spaces we have here and the wonderful parks and trails, but they can also get exposure to career paths so that they can kind of enter this work and become the next generation of environmental leaders in Mercer County and New Jersey and the nation. Uh, so I'm happy about the work that we've been able to do there with Mercer County Park Commission and the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space and Friends of Princeton Open Space are engaged and so many others. And there's more to come on that as well. So keep your eye on that. So I hope I haven't gone on too long. Um, and my job is, is to bring on the, uh, our, present, our next uh, presenters. So uh, our first up, we have a great panel today. Um, we have three wonderful panelists to present tonight. And, but, and after all three presentations are complete, we'll jump into some questions and answers. But first up is Sharon Davis, uh, one of my former DEP colleagues. Uh, Sharon has over 31 years of experience with the NJDEP and is currently the chief of the Bureau of Evaluation and Planning in the Division of Air Quality. The main goals of her program are to reduce the public's exposure to toxic pollutants from industrial sources and develop the state implementation plans to meet the national ambient air quality standards and regional haze goals. That's a mouthful. And I'm sure the job is just as complicated. Uh, prior to working in the air planning program, Sharon was a supervisor in the diesel risk reduction program where she wrote and implemented the diesel retrofit rule led the design of the program's electronic management system and reduced the public's exposure to toxic diesel soot from certain on-road vehicles. Sharon has chaired several regional and national work groups, including the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management Criteria Pollutant Control Group, Work Group, the National Association of Clean Air Agencies Full Cycle Analysis Project Work Group, and the Mid-Atlantic Northeast Visibility Union Technical Support Committee. Sharon has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Rutgers College of Engineering and is a certified public manager. Welcome, Sharon, and thank you so much for participating tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate it. I also want to thank your dog because he gave me the idea that I should probably unplug my printer. <laughs> that's like two inches away from my computer screen. So I, I wanna thank Sustainable Princeton for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so we can go to the next slide and the next slide. So like Jay said, the main mission of my program is to protect the public's health by, by reducing the public's exposure to toxic air pollutants and for developing the plans to meet the national ambient air quality standards for criteria pollutants. So my presentation will present New Jersey's current status for meeting these national standards with a focus on fine particulate matter and ground level ozone, as well as discuss some of our efforts that uh, the New Jersey DEP takes to address toxic air emissions. The goal is to show you how some of the actions you may, you may be taking to address climate change will also help me meet my goals for improving air quality in New Jersey. And just a heads up that I will be speaking fast to get through my, um, my presentation in a timely manner. And I do mention preliminary, and this means that the data is draft. Most of the data that I'm showing you is on our websites and draft just means we haven't put it up there yet. Next slide, please. The United States Environmental Protection Agency established national ambient air quality standards for six criteria pollutants that were deemed to be prevalent in our air and caused human health impacts, damaged property, or harmed the environment. These NACs are shown here. They're ground level ozone, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, lead, and carbon monoxide. And if we aren't meeting a standard, then we have to develop a plan on how we will. And these plans are called SIPs or state implementation plans. Now this chart shows a lot of information about the standards. And as you can see, New Jersey's ambient air monitors are measuring compliance with all of the standards except ozone. Our monitors are actually measuring below the 75 parts per billion standard that I have listed here. But we share, New Jersey actually shares a non-attainment area with parts of Connecticut that are above the standard. And so we still have some obligations associated with the standard, which is why I indicated as not attaining due to other states' monitors. 
I also list at the bottom regional haze because New Jersey does have responsibility to improve visibility at our class one area in Bringentine, New Jersey. And I'm happy to say that we are meeting our goals to achieve that. Next slide, please. Now I'm providing more information on PM 2.5 or fine particulate matter because it is associated with some serious health impacts. 2.5 refers to the size of the particle. And as you can see on the right, it is very small when compared to the cross section of the human hair. It actually can pass through lung tissue and into the bloodstream. And it is known to cause asthma attacks, contribute to heart disease and has been linked to premature death. PM 2.5 is, is emitted directly from sources, but can also be formed through chemical reactions of what we call precursor pollutants. And these include nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compounds, and ammonia. Sources of PM 2.5 emissions include combustion of gasoline, oil, diesel fuel, or wood. So we're talking about things like industrial and home heating, residential wood burning, vehicles and power plants. The chart on the left is New Jersey's PM 2.5 design value trend from 2001 to 2019. The design value is the statistical analysis of our ambient air quality monitoring data to determine compliance with the standard. As you can see from this chart, New Jersey has been meeting the PM 2.5 standard since 2008 and was in attainment when the standard was lowered and became effective in 2013. So this is a good news story, but we want to continue to reduce PM 2.5 levels because of its association with serious health impacts. Next slide, please. So here I provide some data on ground level ozone. Ground level ozone is not emitted directly. It is formed by chemical reactions between the precursor pollutants, nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds in the presence of sunlight and heat. So meteorology plays a big part in ozone formation. We see elevated levels of ground level ozone during the summer. And so we focus our attention on reducing these precursors during what we call ozone season, which, is, which in New Jersey is May to the end of October. As you can see on the slide on the left, New Jersey has made significant reductions in ground level ozone while the standard has become more protective over time. New Jersey is measuring below that 75 parts per billion standard, but we are not yet meeting the most current and protective standard of 70 parts per billion. On the right, I am showing, oops, slide up, thanks. On the right, I am showing New Jersey's two multi-state non-attainment areas with one in the north centered around the New York City metropolitan area and one in the south centered around the Philadelphia metropolitan area, which includes Mercer County. So air doesn't stay in one place. And this is a good way to represent that our actions are linked to the areas around us as well. Next slide, please. So here I'm providing the next level of detail for ozone data by providing some data on the Southern New Jersey ozone monitors. And you can see that the design values have been decreasing since 2018. And in this chart, I do have some preliminary 2020 data. All of the monitors in our southern New Jersey region are measuring attainment of 70 parts per billion standard. The rider uh, monitor and the Washington Crossing monitor, I think they're dark blue and the dark red, are the closest to Princeton and they are both meeting the current standard with a design value of 70 ppb. Now, the DEP also looks at days when the air quality exceeds the human health standards. So looking at 2018, in the chart on the right in the dark blue and 2019 in light blue and 2020 in orange, we can see less and less exceedance days from year to year. To me, this is the most important because this is high levels of air pollution when people are could potentially get exposed. So last year was unique because of the stay at home orders. So we did have less, less car traffic, but it was also very hot. And yet we had very few ozone exceedances. And when compared to the other day, other years, very few monitors saw exceedances when we look at 2018 and 2019. So the 2020 ozone season kicked off on Saturday and I'm really crossing my fingers that we continue to see this trend moving forward, but we shall see. Next slide, please. 
This is showing you the inventory trends for sources of nitrogen oxide emissions in New Jersey. So when it comes to reducing ground level ozone, what we found is that when we reduce emissions of nitrogen oxides, we saw a greater reduction in ozone production. So as you can see, New Jersey has made significant reduction in all sources of NOx in the state when looking at 2002 to 2017. And this includes point sources because we've, um, we regulate power plants, boilers, industrial processes, refineries, chemical processing plants, et cetera. And mobile sources also saw a good reduction because of fleet turnover to cleaner vehicles, but they are by far the large, largest portion of NOx emissions in the state when looking at our most current inventory for 2017. Next slide, please. So I'm switching gears to air toxics in New Jersey. So toxic air pollutants are also referred to as hazardous air pollutants, are those pollutants that are known or suspected to cause cancer or other serious health effects. So air toxic pollution is handled in several ways by the New Jersey DEP. So every three years, the US EPA performs the national scale air toxics assessment to estimate outdoor air concentrations and the potential health risks of air toxics across the country. Now this data is very complicated and it's presented in a very complicated way from the US EPA. So my program analyzes the data specific to New Jersey and we put it in the maps at the census level so it is easy for the public to understand. At the emissions or point source level, air permit application applicants are required to report their air toxic pollutants if they emit above a certain threshold. The DEP will assess those emissions to ensure they have a negligible impact to the nearby community. We use very sophisticated air dispersion modeling tools to assess both cancer and non-cancer risks, and we don't issue a permit unless it meets our threshold for negligible risk. Next slide, please. So this is some of the information you can find from New Jersey DEP's Air Toxics webpage. The, you can see that little map um, on the top left, that shows you how we interpret the NADA data and put it in this sort of simple format. Um, you see it includes, it, it'll note the sources that contribute to the pollutant. So for example, the map is for benzene and benzene's uh, most commonly really, um, emitted from cars and trucks. So, and which happens to be the same, if you remember, as ozone. So it's not surprising that we're seeing a benzene impact all across the state. Um, and I think if you see some of the darker areas, those would really be those areas where we have um, bridges going into New York City, bridges going into Philadelphia, where we see a lot of traffic and congestion. I do want you to note that the most recent data that we have from EPA is from 2014, and we are waiting for them to release the 2017 data. So this is a little outdated. The pie chart on the bottom is an overall showing the majority of the air toxics in New Jersey also come from mobile sources. And then also on our website, we'll, we list um, the chemicals of concern from 2014. So this may change with 2017 data, but I think it provides really good information because it does list um, the sources of those toxic pollutants. And so for the DEP, when we see a point source identified, it helps us take action and follow up where needed. And all this stuff, I do provide links um, where the public can access and find this data. Next slide, please. So I've already mentioned some of the actions the New Jersey DEP takes to reduce air pollution, like regulations of our largest industrial emit emitters, um, how we um, review air permits, but we also regulate consumer products for volatile organic to reduce volatile organic compounds. Um, so these would be cleaning products. You might have seen low VOC paints, your personal care products, automotive products, things like that. And the air pollution can travel very far. And New Jersey has also taken act, at, um, action to address sources outside of New Jersey and upwind of New Jersey that have impacted our air quality. When looking at mobile sources, states are precluded from regulating vehicles and equipment, but New Jersey DEP has done all it can where it can. New Jersey has some of the most stringent idling restrictions. We ensure that cars with the cleanest engine standards in the country are offered for sale here. And our Bureau of Mobile Sources is dedicated to reducing emissions in 
communities through a host of voluntary measures and working to clean our ports. They also have a really great website. They do a lot of social media to help promote and provide information about electric vehicles and to educate the public. And speaking of public outreach, New Jersey also forecasts poor air quality for ozone and fine particulate matter, so the public can change their plans if needed to reduce their exposure when the air pollution may be high. And this is important because it is mostly ozone where we see um, more exceedances. And since ozone is occurring during the summer, it's happening when people are most active outdoors. And also this week is Air Quality Awareness Week. And I will mention a little bit more about that, but happy Air Quality Awareness Week to everybody. Next slide, please. So they told me three takeaways, but I added four. So, um, so these are sort of actions that I, um, you can take to not only just address climate change, but also have the co-benefits to help my program meet its goals. So um, reduce emissions from transportation. And as I showed in my slides, mobile sources contribute the most to ozone, contribute the most to toxics and also greenhouse gases. So purchasing an electric vehicle or the cleanest vehicle you can, one with great mileage will really help reduce emissions. Don't idle, there's just no need to do that. The exhaust is right where we breathe. So turn that engine off, reduce your vehicle miles traveled by carpooling, using public transportation. If you can shop local and walk to do your errands and, and it's safe to do that, um, choose to do that. Um, choose and use your consumer products wisely. So pick ones that have low VOCs or environmentally friendly ingredient, ingredients. Consider electric lawn and garden tools, like avoid spilling that gasoline when you have to fill them up. But if you do have gas tools, then use them wisely. Use them when the air quality is good. So you aren't contributing more to emissions when the pollution might be elevated. Consider cleaner energy options like replace oil heat with gas or electric, consider solar plan panels, shop for clean energy efficient providers. And my bonus material, educate yourself. So you're off to a good start because you're here and that's great. But check out um, our websites, New Jersey DEP does a lot. Follow us on social media, sign up for um, air quality alerts. Um, to, so you're alerted for air quality near you. Um, Join us on social media, things like that. Next slide, please. So this is a shameless plug for Air Quality Awareness Week because my staff is the one that puts it together. So a little shout out, shout out to Stella Olawashiuna Poe who um, does a really great job. Please check out our website. Um, New Jersey provides a lot of information during this week. Circled, see, we, we highlighted sustainable Princeton presentation on our events calendar and um, and it offers a lot of information about some of the actions that New Jersey is doing and then ways the public can help support us in our efforts to clean up the air. Next slide, please. And um, this is just showing you some of the great websites that we have. Um, obviously, we, you know, Governor Murphy has done a ton of stuff to address global warming and climate change. Um, a lot of initiatives for, for electric vehicles in New Jersey. The Drive Green website is really excellent to provide information um, to the public about electric vehicles and incentives in New Jersey. And then in the bottom is what's in my community. And um, this is a, is a mapping app that actually can provide you with information about people who have permits in your community. It is a, a fabulous app to provide information to the public about just the air permit program and, and, um, and, and you can get all kinds of air permitting data from that. And again, this is another shameless plug because um, this was done by my program as well. So um, shout out to Brad Bolin. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then I just wanna end with some useful links. I offer the Division of Air Quality link because a lot of the stuff in my program, uh, in my presentation was other programs. So if you wanna find monitoring data, if you find, wanna find more about air toxics or electric vehicles or mobile sources, the Division of Air Quality is your one-stop shop. You can find them all there. Air Now, go check that out. Um, look for EnviroFlash on that. Now Air Now gives you um, air quality data, but you can also sign up for EnviroFlash and it'll send you alerts when air quality might be elevated to your phone. Well, it'll send alerts to your phone, not that air quality is elevated on your phone. And then um, 
information about Air Quality Awareness Week, Drive Green. And I also provided links to our climate change and resilience, resiliency strategy, if you wanna learn more about some of Governor Murphy's initiatives and the Office of Environmental Justice, um, another, uh, another great New Jersey initiative, and then the What's in My Community app. So um, thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much for that, Sharon. It's such an important uh, topic for us in New Jersey, of course, and um, I especially uh, want to point to the environmental justice work that's being done and the, the fact that we're now creating rules around one of the most progressive or the most progressive uh, environmental justice legislation in the entire nation. So I know you'll be engaged around that issue because air is such a, a, an important component around that. So thank you for that. And I'm sure there'll be questions at the end of the, uh, the program today. But it is my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Dan Van Abs, another one of my former colleagues. Uh, Dan is an associate professor of professional practice for water society and environment at Rutgers University School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, where he focuses on planning and management policy for water infrastructure, water supply, wastewater, and watershed protection. Dan served in New Jersey state government for over 26 years as senior director for planning and science with the Highlands Water Protection and Planning Council implementing the Highlands Regional Master Plan. Yay, Dan, thank you for that. Uh, he was director of watershed protection with New Jersey Water Supply Authority. He spent 12 years in the Department of Environmental Protection and was technical director of the Passaic River Coalition. He holds a PhD in environmental science from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He's a licensed professional planner in New Jersey and a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners and a published author. Welcome, Dan, and thank you so much for joining tonight. Thanks very much, Jay, appreciate it. And uh, thank you also for Sustainable Jersey for having me, uh, Sustainable Princeton, excuse me, for having me here. I had actually signed up to, um, to uh, view this program and um, I'm actually pinch hitting for a friend and colleague, Donna Liu, um, who uh, was instrumental in the what I'm going to talk about tonight, and that is Princeton's water story. So if we could have the next slide, please. Princeton's water story is a wonderful um, video work that Donna put together. And I think we're going to show you a small clip of it. It is available online through YouTube. Uh, next slide, please at uh, this bit.ly address, or you can just search it, Princeton Water Story on YouTube. Um, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, it was developed by Donna Liu. She did this as part of her work on, in the Rutgers Environmental Steward Program. I wound up actually doing the water talk at the Environmental Steward Program that Donna participated in. She has a great background in multimedia journalism. She's a Princeton resident and a very strong environmental advocate. And, and we thank Donna for all of the work that she's done with regard to this. As it mentions here on the slide, this was uh, involved the Watershed Institute as well as Sustainable Princeton. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we're going to watch a clip of it. This presentation of Princeton's water story is meant to help Princeton residents understand where our water comes from, what happens to it as it runs through town, and where it goes. It's the first step in a process laid out by Sustainable Jersey to help municipalities identify, solve, and manage their water resources. Sustainable Jersey, for those not familiar with it, is a nonprofit that supports sustainability planning at the community level. Princeton's most prominent and best known water feature is probably Carnegie Lake, which is a great place to start the conversation about our relationship to water because it's complicated. If you ask people how they feel about Carnegie Lake, you get a range of answers. As scenery, it's delightful. You can walk along the canal, enjoy great views of the lake. If we were to post our feelings about Carnegie Lake on social media, we'd probably give the lake high marks for being photogenic. As a recreational venue, it's Olympic class. Carnegie Lake was constructed as a gift to Princeton University back in 1906, so the rowing team would have a place to practice. The lake welcomes small boats, fishermen, 
even ice skaters on a cold winter's day. Thumbs up for recreation, or at least a qualified kind of recreation. If you were to fall in, however, the water becomes far less appealing. These geese might enjoy swimming in the lake, but the fact that they're there makes the water brown and less inviting for humans to swim in. Swimming is not a good idea. And you absolutely do not want to drink the water or eat the fish you might catch from it. The waters of Carnegie Lake are technically classified as impaired, which means we have water quality problems. Problems much of New Jersey shares. Anyone who gets that close to the water might well post an OMG. This presentation of Princeton's water story is meant to help Princeton residents understand where our water comes from, So it gives you a sense of, of how Donna starts out with this, um, with Carnegie Lake, which of course is absolutely the most recognizable feature of water um, in Princeton, unless you are in the middle of a flood, at which point the water that might be in your backyard or on your street um, may be the most recognizable form of, of uh, water in the, in the uh, town. So, um, some questions that are dealt with in this whole presentation, things like who owns the water and what watershed is Princeton in? Of course, what is a watershed is an important question. Where does our drinking water come from? These kinds of questions are, are dealt with over the course of the video. Next slide, please. So it gives you a sense of where our water comes from, what happens to it as it runs through the town, where the water goes after it leaves us from two different perspectives. One is the natural perspective, stream flow, moving downstream, heading out eventually down the Millstone River to the Raritan River. But it also looks at it from a different perspective, which is the infrastructure. Where does the water supply come from? And then once we use that water, where does it go? One of the interesting aspects of this is that the water supply for the Princeton area comes from downstream and it's actually piped up to us. And then we use it and it's discharged back into the river and it goes downstream. So very interesting as truth from that perspective. Watersheds, of course, the watersheds are the land area that contribute water flow to a single point of outflow. And for us, the single point of outflow is the Millstone River where it hits the Raritan River in between um, Franklin Township and um, Hillsborough and Bridgewater. So right in that area there. But we also have a lot of different smaller watersheds within the larger watershed. And the one we tend to know most in our area is the Stony Brook coming down from the Hope Wells. And of course, within Princeton, even at the smaller level, are watersheds like Harrisbrook watershed, which covers much of the eastern side of the of Princeton, eastern and uh, northern part of Princeton. So these kinds of issues are important to us. Next slide, please. The video goes through a number of different issues. Um, the whole issue of flooding, which is partly from um, stormwater, especially localized flooding like Harry's Brook, is from stormwater moving from impervious surfaces into the stream, and the stream simply cannot handle the total flow that you see, but also regional flooding, such as coming down from Stony Brook during high flow periods. The issues of green infrastructure, how do we manage stormwater in a better way so that we can reduce those peak flows and have the stream be more natural in terms of its flow system. Stormwater system, of course, much of Princeton is developed. Much of that development has um, storm sewers. And so we tend to take a lot of stormwater off the land surface and put it into storm sewers and shoot it right out to the streams, which can cause some real problems. And of course, much of our development is older so it predates all of the modern standards for stormwater management. Drinking water, as I mentioned, we get our water primarily from downstream of us because it's New Jersey American water supply. 
it is um, taking water from two sources. One is the Raritan River, Millstone River confluence, and the other is the Delaware and Raritan Canal. So an interesting fact is that part of our water comes from Port Jervis, New York, because it's coming down the Delaware, it gets captured in the Delaware and Raritan Canal, comes all the way across New Jersey, and then be as part of the New Jersey American water supply. So interesting little factoid there. Then of course, where does it go after we use it? Well, it goes to the Stony Brook Regional Sewerage Authority treatment plant in um, on River Road, right on the Millstone River. And so there we go. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so there's a lot to know about water. Um, water is an endlessly fascinating subject for those who are, are at least remotely interested. Much like air, we can't do without it. But air is always around us. Water comes to us because we make a deliberate effort to bring it to us. And when we use it, we have to make a deliberate effort to manage that. The storm water comes to us with rainfall. We can't control that but we can control how we manage the stormwater that comes to us. And the, the trends of the past where the idea was to just get it off the land surface, get it away as fast as possible, we've now learned that there's no such thing as away, right? Our away is somebody else's here. And so we're learning how to better manage stormwater so that we have fewer uh, damages that are caused by the stormwater over the course of time. So that's what I have for you today with regard to um, the Princeton water story. It is a great video. I've watched it several times now. I certainly encourage you to watch it as well and enjoy the learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Van Epps. It's enlightening and I too am going to make sure that I uh, take a good look at that video because it's super interesting and it's amazing how many people in our landscape don't really understand where their water comes from or where it goes. And this is uh, really something that should be shared widely and I hope that it will be. So thank you again. Um, our next speaker, I'm proud to introduce is literally a real force of nature, uh, Dr. Patricia Shanley exudes conservation enthusiasm and conservation ethic anytime I get a chance to be around her. And um, it's always a joy to spend some time with her. Uh, Trish has 30 years of experience researching the value of forests to local livelihoods and integrating traditional knowledge with science to empower communities in Amazonia, Indonesia, and in New Jersey. Prior to working in the Brazilian Amazon, she spent 10 years as the founding program director of an environmental center in New Jersey that preferentially serves inner city and special needs youth. In Indonesia, she spent 10 years as a senior scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research and is currently program director of People and Plants International, a contributing author on global assessment report on biodiversity and ecosystem services for the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and Associate Director of Woods and Wayside International. Wow, Trish. Uh, she received a BA in Environmental Studies from Rutgers, an MSc from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a PhD in, in Ecology from the University of Kent in Canterbury, England. Uh, Trish publishes extensively on the ecological and cultural value of forests uh, with the Ridgeview Conservancy, she leads a forest stewardship program training youth to conserve and manage forests for the protection of native species. Thank you for joining us tonight, Trish. Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining us this evening. I will speak about what creates clean air and water, forests. Although forests are vital to life on this planet, we are destroying them at an astonishingly rapid rate. At this moment in our planet's history, we need a profound paradigm shift to recognize that forests are irreplaceable and fundamental to our survival. The great landscape architect, Frederick Law Olmsted, 
left a green legacy in Boston when he helped create a ring of interconnected parks, which he called the Emerald Necklace. In Princeton, we have a rare opportunity to save our last unprotected forest and create our own Emerald Necklace. Worldwide, rampant destruction of forests has contributed to climate change, a staggering loss of biodiversity, and a global pandemic. There is scientific consensus that we must act quickly to ensure a livable future. Recently, over 50 countries signed onto a sweeping international agreement called 30 by 30, conserving 30% of the Earth's land and water by 2030. In the U.S., only 12% of our lands are protected, and to reach 30% means conserving an area twice the size of Texas over the next decade. These maps show that over the last 400 years, we have destroyed the vast majority of original forests in the U.S. Today, less than 4% of original forest remains. On this map, we can barely see them. Remarkably, 50 years ago, foresters identified a small patch of primary forest right here in Princeton. However, this rare woodland is currently under the threat of development. So why do older growth forests matter? Older growth forests cannot be constructed. We cannot create them. They are the result of millennium of geological and ecological forces. The biodiversity associated with older growth forests is magnitudes more than other terrestrial ecosystems. Old forests also store huge amounts of carbon, far more than young forests, and they filter vast amounts of pollutants from the air, clean and store water, and prevent floods. Forests are also a massive tonic that fortify our endocrine, respiratory, and nervous systems and have a positive effect on diminishing anxiety, depression, ADHD, and boosting our immune systems. And as we've all learned during COVID, forests are the most accessible and the cheapest therapy in town. Here we can see the percentage of green space in cities and nearby towns. <clears throat> Princeton is currently lagging behind reaching the goal of 30 by 30. To do so, we would need to add at least 10% more open space. But can we? And if so, how? This open space map shows that Princeton has many of the pieces of a ring of interconnected parks, the result of dedicated effort by many people over the last several decades. To complete the Emerald Necklace, we now need to save the last two large unprotected forests in blue on this map and secure connectors to link these and other green spaces to downtown and neighboring communities. Outlined in yellow are the two largest, oldest, unprotected forests left in Princeton. Like bookends, one is located in the northeast corner and the other in the northwest. These are like having the Museum of Natural History and Franklin Institute right in town, except they are more exciting as they are not curated, but alive. The one in the west is a stunning 153-acre woods, which is habitat for endangered and threatened species such as the red-shouldered hawk and barred owl, and is a critical wildlife and potential hiking corridor to the Sauerland Mountains. The large, old trees found in this forest sequester an estimated 340 megatons of carbon, the equivalent of over 2,500 households' annual carbon output. A proposal to build 19 homes on this property would remove over 4,000 trees, Given that each tree provides ecosystem services equivalent to two air conditioners, the ambient temperature would rise. And when you stand in the center of this forest, you do not hear cars. For children that may never visit the Adirondacks, this may be the wildest place they ever explore. The historic 90-acre forest on the crest of Mount Lucas is a critical keystone property contiguous with Autumn Hill Reserve and Herontown Woods. It contains rare old growth forests, extensive wetlands, exceptional vernal ponds, and is habitat for endangered and threatened birds and reptiles. A rare species specialist in New Jersey proclaimed, this is one of the most impressive vernal ponds I have ever seen. The abundance of wood frogs is astounding. This pond is responsible for the survival of this meta population. These acres were also part of New Jersey's first orphanage, a significant site in African-American and women's history, and are now nominated for New Jersey's Register of Historic Places. 
A site plan application to construct 33 homes on the 90 acres is currently before Princeton's Planning Commission. This is the entrance to the 153 acre property, a grand beech, oak, and hickory forest of striking beauty. Next, we see some of the endangered and threatened species that grace these two magnificent woodlands. Globally, one million species are at risk of extinction. In Princeton, we are facing local extinction of species such as these if we lose these two forests. Another powerful public health reason to protect forests and wetlands is that they are habitat to fox and other predators that prey upon white-footed mice, which spread Lyme disease. Undisturbed forests with fewer invasive species harbor less infectious disease. If we truly care about species extinction locally and globally, there is nothing more important that we can do than to save these last two forests and the linkages to other forests in the area. Transformational leadership on the part of each of us, parents, teachers, youth, and public officials, is needed to protect these last forests and linkages and leave an equitable, accessible green legacy. We also need to repair the rupture between nature and people and get youth and families off their screens and into the woods, exploring, respecting, and stewarding forests. Relative to the substantial time spent in preparation for SATs, ACTs, and APs, time in nature is meaningful, profound, and a lasting gift to our children. Over the last seven years, over 100 students from Princeton High School have volunteered to help remove invasive species and create trails in what will soon become a new forest reserve in Princeton called Ridgeview Woods. Through hard, all-season, hands-on work, these spirited students have come to appreciate the critical role of forest in our lives. In addition, a vibrant consortium of schools is coming together to support Princeton's Emerald Necklace Initiative. Students learn native and invasive species management and help to store their own schoolyards and nearby forests. In closing, since these forests will belong to youth, we will hear from Annie Way, this year's wonderful leader of the Ridgewood Wood Stores. Hi, my name is Annie. Um, I'm a member of the Ridgeview Woods Conservation Crew, and I've been really fortunate to grow up in Princeton because there are some green spaces for kids to spend time in nature. So as a kid, I would hike and I would climb trees all the time. So at the moment, it's, it feels natural for me that the well-being, the physical and mental well-being of people is interlinked with the well-being of forests. Um, however, this is not emphasized in our school curriculum. So um, with the Emerald Necklace, we're proposing that schools hold um, ecological literacy classes outside of the classroom as theoretical knowledge can only go so far. What really keeps me coming back every week isn't um, like what I read from books, the benefits of forests. It's actually being in forests and feeling how happy, ha how happy forests make you and like how you feel like physically and mentally better after a time in the woods. So therefore, I think um, the Emerald Necklace would be um, a crucial part of the psychological and mental well-being of Princeton. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Trish. Um, I know Trish, um, Dr. Shanley, uh, is on the call. I think that she didn't want to tempt the fates with her bandwidth uh, to go live. So she taped that segment for us, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, so thank you, uh, Trish, for that. Um, so I'm going to just get us started with a couple of questions as we lead into the Q&A period. And I'll start with Trish, I, mainly just to make sure that you're here on the screen with us and that you're live and ready to go. Um, but uh, I understand that, as you stated, that you've worked in the Brazilian Amazon for many years, for decades. And I'm wondering just how has that experience informed your work here at home? Sure. Thank you, Jay. And it's a real honor to be here. Um, I came in the Brazilian Amazon. I was really privileged to be there when there was a dramatic drop in deforestation. So I got to see the elements of what brought that about. 
There were three main factors. There was really strong political will. There was dense scientific capacity that was applied locally and throughout the region and nationally. And also there was collective action. There was a saying that um, each drop of blood sprouts a new tree. People died to protect forest. So I feel that the paradigm shift that happened when I was in the Amazon was to stop just raising forests rampantly and to really protect them. And all sectors of society got on board. And when I came to Princeton, it was really shocking to see how many wetlands and forests and that there's the last of what's left in Princeton has been going. So I think we really need more collective action. We definitely see political will jumping on board now. And I think we need to see science applied locally as well as nationally and internationally. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shanley. Um, and I'll just pose the next question. I think I'll go to Dan. Um, are there major differences in why different areas of Princeton have flooding and how will climate change really affect flooding levels as we go forward? So yes, to the first question, there, there are definite differences to why um, areas of Princeton flood. Um, on the sort of the southwest side, you have uh, Stony Brook, which is a stream that is coming off the Sourlands from the Hope Wells into, um, into Princeton. And that stream gets flash flooding, in part because the, the rocks that it's on in its upper areas really don't allow much water to penetrate into the ground. And so what falls tends to run very fast. It's also the reason that Stony Brook can go very dry during um, summertime when you have long periods without rainfall. So that's one that's more of a regional flooding kind of issue. The areas um, affected by Carnegie Lake, of course, you have the, the lake. It tends to spread out flood flows. It rises more slowly. It falls more slowly. Um, so you have a different effect there. And then you have the small streams within town. And Harry's Brook, of course, is notorious for this, where um, it's, it's a relatively small stream, relatively small watershed, but it's getting stormwater from a large chunk of Princeton's most developed areas. And so the result there is the water hits these impervious surfaces, whether it's buildings or roads or sidewalks, moves into the storm drains, moves into Harry's Brook very fast. And there are really only a few places where we even have stormwater basins that were built decades ago. Um, so the result is very fast increase in the, in the flows and you get that, that flooding effect and then it drops down very quickly after that. Now, what's going to happen with climate change is what's already happening with climate change. You know, people talk about climate change being in the future, no. Climate change is now and has been now for quite some time. So what we're seeing in the entire Northeast is that more and more of our rainfall is coming in hard storms, not these multi-day sort of trickling down and everything's nice and calm, but in one inch, two inch, even three inch storms. That's going to increase because the, the, as the atmosphere gets warmer, it gets more energetic, it gets more active. And so we're seeing um, sharper storms, we're seeing more of them, and we're going to see more of them. And that means more of this really fast flooding, the street flooding, the Harry's Brook flooding. Excellent, thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, and uh, I'll just ask one more question and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, I just wanted to circle back to Sharon and as Dr. Van Abs indicated, uh, you know, water we bring to us or it comes to us, but air is all around us. So what's kind of the easiest, best, kind of most efficient and effective thing we can do to make a difference in our air quality? Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, I, I think um, one of the best things we could do is, um, and I kind of said it in my presentation, I think if you can buy the cleanest car that you can afford, um, that has a great impact because it, it's kind of getting, it's like a triple threat. So if you buy a cleaner car, you're affecting ozone, you're affecting fine particulate matter, 
um, you're affecting toxics and greenhouse gas emissions. And so it, um, I, I say the cleanest car that you can afford, because I know that you, you, electric vehicles are emerging on the market right now. But I think too, with the the DEP has offered some incentives, and so it's it's going to try and make them a little more competitive with um, with standard car prices. So hopefully there'll be more, and it'll force technology to get something more affordable for the regular public. But so in my opinion, I think it's that um, anything you can do to 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 um, and combustion. So anything to do cleaner combustion in your home. Um, um, that seems to be what creates a lot of pollution is just combusting um, gas. So electric tools, things like that, um, I think is where we can get the most bang for our buck, especially cars, like the exhaust is right there where you breathe. So for me, I always like think, oh, you know, um, I've seen in Trenton, you know, we, we um, put diesel particulate filters on those buses. That was one of the things that my program did. And to not see that soot coming out of the back of those um, public transportation, those, those New Jersey transit buses was immediately noticeable. And I couldn't believe how much easier it was to breathe because we took that soot out. So kind of the same concept with electric vehicles. Um, you just take it away. So, um, so I, that that I think I think anything in that in the transportation section is, is going to get you the biggest bang for your buck. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sharon. So now I'm going to throw you guys to the wolves. Uh, we're opening up to the uh, questions from the audience, and the organizers are going to take it from here. So thank you all. Absolutely. Uh, so I'll start with our first question, who is from Mark Watts. He asks, does sea ozone influence levels in New Jersey? Oh, okay. Um, so there's a, there's a couple answers to that. So what we've noticed is say our New Jersey's coastline. So if the if the there's a sea breeze coming in off of our coastline from the um, from the ocean, it it does tend to clean our monitors out. However, if you're looking for something like a bay breeze effect, and what we've seen up in the New York City area, like the Long Island Sound, that's sort of between Long Island and the Connecticut monitors, there's um, actually the the ozone will kind of cook on top of that. Sometimes they call it the Bay Breeze effect. You'll see it in um, Chesapeake Bay. They've seen it in the lakes um, around Michigan where ozone will actually like travel over and, and it'll stay overnight and it'll kind of cook because the water is um, um, I think a little bit warmer. And so then when, when cooler air comes down it'll actually push it, push that ozone. So it'll actually create ozone that'll just stay there and then push it into um, onto land in Connecticut. And that's why we think is part of the reasons we're seeing high ozone. So, um, so there's kind of like two different answers there. Um, but yes, so we can see, um, yeah, we can see ozone definitely affected when you have this sort of Bay Breeze or, or Long Island Sound. Or, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think it does. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of more on idling, which I assume you will take as well. Uh, Catherine Widener asks or explains that she lives on a street where parents pick up kids from school and is wondering how we can have the schools make parents aware that idling contributes to pollution. Um, Phyllis also asked that the or mentioned that the anti-idling law isn't in forced in Princeton. Um, she also references the um, kids being dropped off at school as a main source of it um, and notes that no one stops them or even tells them that they're not allowed to idle for longer than three minutes. So um, how does the DEP expect this law to be enforced? Um, okay, really great question. So I actually gave Josh a link to the Mobile Sources website and they do have a stop the soot um, email. And if you go on the, their main website, you'll see idling as one of the thumbnails on the side and you could go down and they have campaign materials. Um, they have a lot of outreach materials to help parents. I really recommend you get in touch with them because they may be able to help give you ideas on organizing 
um, a way to inform parents. I agree with you. Like for a long time, I would post stuff on my school's Facebook page and I used an EPA brochure because it, it seemed a lot more scarier, you know, <laughs> kind of like these dire things um, because that's my pet peeve too. If people kind of idling their cars where kids are standing, they've got, um, they breeze, breathe twice as much as adults, they're growing, they get more in their lungs. So um, I highly recommend you email them and let them set you up. In the past, there was one particular point. I was there when I was working in the diesel program. Um, there was a woman that worked there, Melinda Dower, and she had her own little personal army because she was really proactive working with schools, getting them to sign up to no idling campaigns. There are signs that you can um, purchase um, from the DEP. Um, your school could hang them up. So um, I think that's the best way to help you. Um, and and they are um, a really, really, really great group of people that are, are really motivated to um, work with the public and help them um, address their issues and concerns. So um, check out that website and contact them. Thank you. Okay, and I saw that Josh did put that link in the chat um, for everyone to access. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears a little and take a question from Kate who asked, what can people do to help purify large bodies of water and what effect has water contamination had in Princeton on marine life? And I think it was water contamination in Princeton. What has that had on marine life? Right. So Princeton is part of a watershed. And one of the things about watershed is that there's the old phrase, everybody lives upstream and everybody lives downstream. So if you're looking to protect water resources, you need to involve the people who live upstream of those water resources. And you need to do your part for those water resources. And what do we mean by that? The main pollutants that we see in our water resources in New Jersey, in this area as well, are um, land-based pollutants. So they will be uh, fertilizers, nitrogen, phosphorus, fertilizers. They will be pesticides that people are using primarily on their lawns, but also that um, farmers will use in the um, upstream portion of the Millstone River, for instance. And they will be the pollutants that get entrained in stormwater. And that can be everything from um, material that is, is worn off of brake linings, oil from cars, all of these kinds of things pet waste for those who um, don't do the right thing or do the half right thing, which is that you get your pet waste and you put it in a plastic bag and then you throw it in the storm sewer, which I have seen people do, um, you know, just please. <laughs> so the part of it is personal responsibility. Part of it is working more broadly. How do we better manage our stormwater? Well, if our stormwater is going into green stormwater infrastructure so that it's filtrating through um, soil layers and so on, well, then all of those pollutants aren't going into the streams. Part of it is going to be on a more massive scale. And so that's going to involve the New Jersey DEP, the New Jersey Department of Agriculture, Cooperative Extension from my um, university from Rutgers, working with both um, farmers and with homeowners and landowners, all of these kinds of things play a part. There's no one slick answer to it. It is, you know, it, water pollution is, is death by a thousand cuts and getting rid of water pollution is band-aids by a thousand band-aids, right? It's, it's that kind of thing. The one pollutant that we are not going to get rid of easily is um, in many ways a legacy pollutant and that's mercury. And the mercury has come from coal fire power plants among others. And we have mercury warnings for fishing in most of New Jersey. That's once the mercury is there, it doesn't disappear. It, it doesn't break down, it's, a, it's an element. You can't break it down. So that's going to move very gradually out, which gets to the latter part of the question. Everything that we do goes out to the Raritan Bay. And that means that all of those pollutants eventually work their way down to the Raritan Bay and they become part of the pollutant load to the bay along with what comes out of the earth or kill and communities along the bay front itself. So the Raritan Bay is not in great shape. 
it's lost most of its um, oyster col uh, colonies and so on. And so bit by bit, it's being improved, bit by bit. It takes a long time. It's taken decades already. It's going to take decades into the future. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, so another question I think uh, might involve um, Dr. Stanley, Shanley, excuse me. Julie is asking, what can the community do to help preserve those forests in the emerald necklace? Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, well, we need to really build a movement. We need to educate the population. We need communication and outreach. Where are these forests? What's in them? I think we need to deepen our sort of ecological and historical literacy about actually who lived here because there's really interesting historical information about each of these sites also. We need to fundraise. The, it's, we're Princeton and these are gonna be costly to buy. I believe you know, we'll have a consortium already of organizations working towards that, but we'll all need help in those regards. We also could use help storting these forests. We need youth to be, jump into them. So there's this new consortium of schools, but we'll be very interested in having adults and young people get educated about how to manage these forests and be really a part of storting them for the future so that we have a connection. I think all of us need to look around at near our homes, where we walk, where are there patches that are not yet developed? We should be more aware of what's happening in the planning board and the zoning board, because many of these decisions are made and we don't know about it. So I think we have to take a lot more responsibility for anything, any forest we see nearby. And um, let's get youth involved because they need to get out. They've been um, suffocated by Zoom for over a year. There's a great opportunity to heal them to restore our forests together. So I think it's a really good time now to work with the schools and we're scouts with all sorts of groups to get our youth and our families outdoors, storting these forests and fighting for them and feeling a part of doing the right thing right now, both globally and locally. That's wonderful, thank you. Uh, so the next question, it looks like um, pretty much each of you could provide an answer. I don't know, Jay, if you want to help um, move this one around. But the question is, what role, it's from Diana, and it's what role do synthetic pesticides and fertilizers play in climate change, air quality, and water quality, and I would add soil quality? Um, and then how do we monitor these impacts in New Jersey? Thanks. I'll jump in first, but I'll leave it to the other more wise experts to, uh, to follow up. Um, I know that our organization are really trying to move the farmers that are farming on our properties away from uh, neonics um, and um, Roundup Ready crops, uh, because we're very interested in uh, making sure that the soil health is, is going to be protected. Um, we really believe that, you know, productive soils and organic matter in soils that build up through organisms over many years really help to sequester carbon uh, more than soils that have been treated routinely with pesticides and herbicides. So we're really trying to move our farmers away from using um, treated seed and other synthetic uh, herbicides and pesticides. Um, but, and we're also trying to, to set up demonstration projects so that we can ask other farmers to replicate what our farmers are doing and to convince the Department of Agriculture to embrace some, uh, some mechanisms to help farmers make transitions to more sustainable practices. We know that it's not just going to be our forests that sequester carbon in New Jersey, but also our, our farmlands if we treat our soils properly. So we're worried about soil organisms and we're also worried about, very worried about our pollinators. So I think from our standpoint, from a natural resource conservation organization, um, I think that we're really primarily interested in making sure that we're protecting the soils and protecting our pollinator insects. But with regard to the other air and water quality, I'll leave that to the other experts on the panel. Dan, would you like to take it? Like you were about to. Well, I was going to pass it to Sharon, actually. But uh, the the from a water quality perspective, um, the the key is that if you overuse fertilizers, it can damage water quality, whether it's an organic fertilizer or a, a manufactured fertilizer. 
So the, the critical issue is, is to avoid overusing it. And the soil testing lab at Rutgers has done, um, has run tests for residential owners and for uh, agricultural owners for a long time. And I will tell you that between the two, the ones that have show the greatest excess in fertilization of their properties are the residents, not the farmers. Why? Well, because it costs money for farmers, it reduces their profit margin. For residents, it seems to be, well, if one bag does a good job, then two bags must do twice as good a job. And that's not how it works. Um, so do your soil test, use only what you need, um, leave your grass, grass clippings on your lawn so that you can recycle the nutrients back into the lawn, build up the soil carbon content, do all those good things, um, because otherwise I know where it's going to go. It's going to go into the water. Thank you. Sharon, want to take a turn? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think mostly uh, fertilizers and, and stuff like that, um, pesticides in, in like a farming aspect is managed by the Department of Agriculture in New Jersey. Um, I don't believe uh, we regulate, uh, I have not seen it. So it's not something that I've seen that we've regulated. Um, from an air quality perspective, I will say we do account for farming operations in our inventory and it, it doesn't rise, uh, at least for air. So definitely like there's water quality issues. Um, from an air perspective, we just have bigger issues. So we account for the emissions, but they don't rise to the top of of being um, very large, like in our top 15, or we typically look at top 15, well, I do. <laughs> so moving forward and stuff like that. So it's it's just not something that we see rising very high from an air, air, um, air perspective. That makes sense. So but one thing from a climate change perspective is um, the creation, especially of artificial nitrogen fertilizers is fairly energy intensive. And so when you think about how much agriculture we have in the United States, that's a fair amount of energy output to just create the fertilizer in the first place. So that, that you need to take that into account as well. Yeah, the emissions from the manufacturer. Okay, okay. so in that perspective, we definitely regulate them. And we definitely have some of the, the most stringent regulations in the country. Um, we're going to have even more with some of Governor Murphy's climate change initiatives. So, um, so in that in that respect, we do we do regulate from an industrial perspective. We will re regulate the manufacturing and and um, make sure that's clean. Great, uh, Trish, did you have a comment on that as well? The use of um, fertilizers. Um. I just think it's really critical that we stop using, you know, a lot of what's on the land are amazing plants that have been deliberately brought over from Europe when settlers came here that are full of micronutrients. They're healing, they're curing, and we use a lot of cosmetic, this isn't fertilizer, but cosmetic herbicides. And we just have to stop that. We really have to see dandelions as a badge of honor. And that means that we're not, you know, we don't have a toxic lawn and have toxins that are carcinogens going into our water source and poisoning our pets and our children. I mean, we just really, the research is there and it's really important we become educated and talk to our lawn care people and not just allow them to do a default option. And um, so I think we just have to, that's transformational leadership to just tomorrow call your land care people and let them know that you know, we really don't wanna to put toxic substances on our lawns, that it's not necessary. And you can have a beautiful biodiverse lawn with um, wonderful wild edibles if you don't do that. Great, thank you. 
Um, so we have a comment from James Bash regarding um, electric vehicles, and he notes that if you consider the total lifetime costs, including fuel and maintenance, EVs typically work out to be less expensive than gas vehicles, even without tax incentives. So that's a nice little um, plug for the idea you mentioned, Sharon. And then that leads to a question that James had as to whether or not the EV tax credits in New Jersey had run out. Is that something that you can comment on and, and when they might be back? I, um, I'm sorry, I really don't know, but what I do wanna say, and if you want me to provide that link to Josh, I can. Um, the Drive Green website is really fabulous. I, I look at that quite a bit and cause I'm, I'm someday gonna get a new car and I, I really, they, they have a, a, a calculator. If you look at um, incentives to drive green, which is on that web page, um, they actually have a link to say, here's what your incentives are in, in New Jersey. And then if you scroll all the way down, there's a can I afford it calculator, there's a vehicle cost calculator, there's an electric drive. They, they just have so much on this. Um, it pays to plug in is there. <laughs> their branding, I guess. So um, I'm going to provide that link. And yeah, it looks like Josh just got it in. Oh, great. Josh is, is much quicker than me. And it, and it lists incentives for um, federal incentives as well. So I, I really thought, I didn't think it did run out, but I got to say, don't quote me on anything. Um, try to go to that website. And again, I think um, if they have contact information, you can call, but they're, really uh, they're very passionate about electric vehicles so um i know that they'll give you the information you need great okay we just have um a couple maybe one or two more before we close up one is whether or not i don't know if any of you can comment um municipal properties in princeton whether or not they are being managed using pollutants or do they manage public land um, with organic land care standards um, is anybody able to comment on what's happening on the municipal level? That way? No? Okay. Um, all right, then let's um, move on to a question I think everyone can comment on. And it wasn't specified as to which field, but Matthew asked, what are some ways people or students can get involved who have no prior experience in this field? So if it's each of you, um, as your last question, um, thinking of, um, whether or not uh, people want to get involved in your respective fields, how would how would they go about it? Would you like to start, Jay? Sure, I will. Thank you so much for that question. And um, you know, I think that one of the things organizations like ours, all of our organizations, can do better at is being ready to answer that question because I think that it comes up often, and we're not quick enough to give a deliberate, direct answer. But I would just say that. You know, there are so many organizations that are working in this landscape that are doing exceptional work that you do a little research and see what interests you most. I mean, there are a lot of nonprofits around, New Jersey Conservation Foundation, uh, the Friends of Princeton and Hopewell Open Space, uh, the Watershed um, Institute. Um, you just have to really just do a little research and kind of see what excites you most about this industry. Um, and and just try to just call just send an email or call somebody and say this is who I am and this is what I'd like to get it, get involved with. Uh, there are internships routinely coming through um, our doors, and we do bring a lot of people on to, as journey people and uh, interns. So I think there are opportunities there, but I think that you need to kind of look at the field, look at the work that all of us are doing collectively, and see what it is that excites you most um, and where you would like to engage, because I'm sure that there are plenty of opportunities, but you have to be the one who kind of goes after it, quite honestly. Sharon, what about you? Okay, um, so I think there's any number of ways for the public to get involved with the DEP. So, Definitely, if you see something going on that um, you, you'd like enforcement to come out, um, if someone's illegally dumping or something like that, uh, I think it's it's WARN DEP. Um, so call our enforcement program. They will come out and investigate it. You know, if you see something that's 
um, coming out of a stack that does, that's really a dark plume or something like that. Help us get out there so we can enforce our rules and regulations. If you see stuff, uh, if the stream all of a sudden turns purple, well, call our enforcement agents so they can come out and investigate it because we we rely on you. You you're closest to these. We we only we are limited in staff, so we really rely on the public um, to kind of work with us to help us um, address environmental issues and problems. Send us emails. Um, check out our website. Um, I think um, engaging the DEP and just keeping us you know, um, asking us questions and just learning more is really useful. I, I, I love it when the public contacts us. Um, I think too, from students, um, we have internships as well. Uh, the DEP, I, I'm not sure with this environment anymore what the status is, but the DEP hosted Watershed Ambassadors Program um, and college students co go out and, and, edu and do public outreach and and work with communities to um, educate them about watersheds and things like that. So there's um, programs out there, there's internships at the DEP for students to get some experience and then really see kind of the, the work that we do and, and, and help the environment. Great, and I know we're uh, just over the end of the program. So if Dan and Trish could also chime in just quickly what somebody might do if they wanna get into your fields. Dan, would you like to start? So um, the Watershed Ambassadors, by the way, I probably have had 15 to 20 of my students go through that program, which is it's great. Um, I would suggest that the a great way to start is where you live. You can learn small things that you can do in your own homes, if you have a yard in your own yard, if you don't have a yard in your own neighborhood, or even if you do have a yard in your own neighborhood. And every one of those things can then be replicated at a larger and larger and larger scale. So learn what you can do where you have some real influence or control and then spread out from there. And by the way, on behalf of Donna Liu and my colleagues, Rutgers Environmental Stewards Program if you really want to get into this, it's a great program. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely have to give props to that. Um, okay, Trish, how about you? Sure, I completely agree with what Dan said. I think in school sometimes lately we get taught about a lot of other countries and other places when most of these social and environmental issues are happening right in our backyard. And so Matthew, I would highly suggest, I, I agree with what everybody else has said, I'd say field experience. I think it's easy to get caught up into administration really young. You want to get out and get dirty and wet and measure that air, that forest now and do it for as long as you can. So you really get to know the resource that you're working on. And, um, uh, you know, I, all of these places that uh, Jay mentioned, Ridge Conservancy has a team. You saw some of the youth. We have college students and high school students that come to learn the species. They learn what they're used for what their ecology is, which is invasive and native. And that's also done with these other organizations. So I think, I think it's really important to get out in the field. And secondly, um, volunteer. The way I got to the Amazon, I'd worked extensively in the States, um, but then I just, you go for free, people take you when you're young. So um, you can get in almost any door at your age. And so jump in wherever you want, get the experience and learn from good mentors. Find people who are passionate and really care about what they're doing and are looking to make an actual impact with relevant research. There's a lot of irrelevant research that is not needed. And at this point in the Earth's history, we need to really think carefully about what we're researching and what we're doing with it and be um, accountable to those with whom you're researching. Well, great advice from all of you. That's wonderful. I want to be young again so I can take it. Um, but before we leave, I would like to do another plug for um, ways that you can get involved, and that is our Star Neighborhood Program. If you live in Princeton, just look around your neighborhood. It could be your block. It could be several blocks. Um, and just think what you want to do to make your neighborhood more sustainable. And then reach out to me because I would love to help you with it, that effort. We currently have 10 neighborhoods. So um, join it before um, so you don't feel left out. 
So um, with that, a, a warm um, thank you to each of our presenters. Um, I hope that the audience enjoyed their um, thoughtful consideration of the topics and that you will all join us for a future program. So on behalf of everyone at Sustainable Princeton, thank you and have a good night. <laughs>